I talk about uh, Funk ADL. I have this notebook, which I think can run uh, on Binder, but uh, I was not organized enough to, to get it all uh, prepared on there beforehand. Um, but yeah, so that, as was already said, this is really focusing on the getting into some of the nitty gritty details of language that that uh, we saw that goes into a lot of the work that uh, that Gordon and I uh, and by um, have been doing. And right, so so this funky ADL is this functional analysis description language. Um, this uh, I talked about this at, at uh, Chep or VChep um, in the past couple months. So so you may have already uh, heard about it a bit if you if you were at that. Uh, so I copied some of the motivation basically from those slides. Um, there's kind of two main uh, uh, motivations, kind of two camps that are, that are motivating Funk ADL. One is query languages coming from database management systems, um, and the other is functional languages. So query languages um, and databases have these advantages in terms of avoiding data redundancy, where the idea is that you just query uh, your data source that's that's stored in, in the database. And um, uh, there's, no, there's no connection between the query that you're writing and how and where the data is actually stored. Um, so it can be in some central place, like running in service X um, at some uh, cluster. Uh, and then also, th this is closely related to data independence. So this is this is really more focused on the idea that the, the code or the queries um, are not connected to the schema, the physical and logical schema of the data. The interface is completely separated. The, the language that you use to access the data is not connected to the, the format or location. Um, this is a key aspect of uh, languages like SQL. And, and then for functional languages, so these, this is the functional programming paradigm um, has a lot of uh, advantages for uh, for analysis, uh, data analysis. It's um, a type of declarative programming, so it's it's not procedural. You don't focus on writing how you loop over um, and iterate over every uh, part of the the data. It's stateless, or at least that's. Uh, the purest functional programming is, is is stateless, where there's no side effects. You don't have uh, global variables and things that are carried around, um, and it's very easy to make functional languages. They're kind of they're kind of intrinsically lazy because everything is um, in terms of functions are first class citizens. So functions are really passed around rather than values or the evaluated functions. It's just the functions themselves, and uh, this little. Um, I think it's uh, missing there. Uh, so the yeah, these these concepts help uh, insulate uh, in a couple of ways the analysis code from the data storage format and location, um, and and also insulate each part of your code from other parts of the code, so more modular. Um, okay, and and as I said, Funk ADL is borrowing from these concepts the functional data query language using Python as a host language. Um, and it's based on quite a bit on Link, which is a collection of features that are built into C Sharp. Uh, so for this notebook, OK, so I just set up some things. I use matplotlib. Uh, let me see, I think everything is filled here. So I'll just uh, yeah, I'll restart and clear the output. So uh, yeah, I use matplotlib um, just as the, the basic plots um, in here. And so what I'll be using in, for Funk ADL uh, is the, I'll be using a particular backend. So Funk ADL is the language, the interface, front, the user facing interface. And then um, your query that you write in that interface gets run by a backend that can translate into all the details of how to run that query. And that can depend on where what the format is or where the, the the data is, so that's this is the level of separation between the interface and uh, and the actual execution. So here I'm using the upper backend. Um, there's you already heard about the just exit 
there's, there's the CMS uh, like open data backend and there's an XAOD backend. Uh, I've focused, most of my work has been on the uproot backend. So here I say from Funk ADL uproot, which is the package for the uproot backend, I import uproot data set. So this is explicitly um, saying that I want to use the uproot backend, which is quite powerful. It can run on any Entuple that doesn't require special uh, like framework software to, to interpret. Um, so any flat on tuple. So I'll load, uh, import that. And then the data set that I'm using here is it's in nano AOD format. Uh, so I, so here I'm actually using the full file that's on X or D um, and it's been converted from CMS open data. Uh, so I'm using this root path here in the binder version. Uh, it's so this, this, this file is fairly large. It's well, like 50 gigabytes or something, not not huge. Um, but for faster and easier running and easier use on binder, I wasn't sure if XRT worked through through binder. I just copied a small subset of this of this file. So if you opened it, if you open the GitHub repository, this will just be a file that's a small file that's sitting in the uh, in the repository that just has the first thousand events from this sample. So I'm going to try to see if if I can run on the full sample during the talk here. So okay, now I have this data set. So in the rest uh, of the notebook, uh, the strategy that I'm going to use here is basically I'm going to act like this is a tutorial on Funk ADL. So I'll kind of introduce new concepts gradually. And then once we have some concepts, then start applying them to these bench ADL functionality benchmarks that were developed by the HEP Software Foundation and IRISEP to demonstrate functionality, the core functionality between different analysis description languages. So we'll see those come up as we pick up the tools necessary. So the first thing, the most important thing to be able to understand how to write something in Funk ADL um, is that almost everything is treated as a sequence of some generic elements. Um, so for example, an array is a sequence of rows. So an array can easy, easily be looked at um, or at least an array that has more than one dimension. And it's not just a 1D array. So usually we at least have events. And then uh, in, in HEP, we usually have events and then things within that event. So there's usually at least two dimensions. So the array of events is, is a sequence of rows, each row corresponding to an event. Um, so this data set object that I have here that I call data, DS, this upper data set, to Funky AL, this is just a sequence of event objects and so an event object is a effectively a dictionary or a record um, containing all of the properties of the event um, and these values can either be scalar primitive types like ints or floats or they can be sequences themselves of other primitives or sequences of sequences and so on um, so Almost all Funk ADL query operators expect to act on a sequence. Uh, so the most common uh, type of operator is select. That's kind of the most basic one. So select is a projection operator. It transforms each element of a sequence that it's given according to some predicate lambda function. And the output will be the sequence of all the transformed elements. So it's basically a map, like the built-in Python function map, but it's just more generic um, uh, because you can do it at different nesting levels. So for each one of these operators, I kind of give a, I say like a visual demonstration of semi pseudocode what, what is happening with each operator. So here, if we have this sequence of like one, two, three, and we apply a select operator on it. Uh, here, the projection function or the mapping function is just take each element x and add one to it. So it turns this sequence left into the sequence on the right. It just adds one to each element. And this is all we need for the, the first benchmark task. So the first, the first one 
uh, is there, there are eight of them. I think I put the link up here. Yeah. Uh, the first one is, I, we, I won't go through all of them, uh, but the first one is to plot the missing ET of all events. So this, so met is stored in a branch that's just called met PT missing ET. Um, and so this, the query, it looks like this, and we can assign it to a variable. This is just this pure funk ADL query. It's this data set dot select, and then we use this function to map each event object to this value within the event, the met PT. And so I can evaluate that cell and it, it, it immediately returns uh, because we didn't actually do anything with the data yet. Uh, Funk ADL uses delayed execution, um, as was mentioned in the last talk. So the value won't be calculated until we ask for the value by saying dot value. So then in the next cell, if I hit, uh, if I execute this, now it's taking a second, it's executing with the time on here. So it takes a few seconds um, to pull out all of the missing ET values uh, from all the, I forget, it's like 50 million, 15 million events or something like that. Um, in fact, well, no, yeah, okay, we'll, we'll get to other operators later. But so now I have the actual, uh, the array of net. And so now I can examine this. It's just an awkward array of all of these values. And the, all of the values are in GEB. Um, there you go, there are 53 million events. Um, and then I can plot it, which is what the task, the task says to plot a histogram of all of the missing ET uh, variables across events. So that'll take a second. Uh, there we go. Okay. Wow. okay, if you zoom in, the plot gets huge. But here's a histogram of, of the missing ET for all events. Now, okay, so the next operator is select many. Uh, so this is an operator that it starts by doing the exact same thing as select, but after it applies the function, the, the mapping function, it assumes that the output for each element will be a sequence itself. And then after it does this for all of the elements, it will concatenate all of the resulting sequences. So again, visually, it looks like this. So if I take this little sequence here, apply a select mini, where I just transform each element into a sequence of one minus the element and then one plus the element, then I'll get six elements out because it turned it into this intermediate sequence, um, a sequence for each element, and then it just concatenated them together. And normally this operator is used when the elements were already sequences. So things like jets and electrons and muons, we already have a sequence of those in the event. So um, we can actually use select many just to flatten the array without doing anything else. If we just have a trivial uh, mapping function to for each element to itself. So this will just flatten like this, this jagged array into a 1D array. And so, so usually we're using select many on something like jets. So here the, the next task is to plot the PT of all jets. So I use select many on the jet PT um, let's do this. And so it'll take uh, probably a few seconds to execute. Now, one thing that you can see is that you could also just use select for this. There's nothing wrong about, uh, about just using select, but if you do this, you will get a jagged array out because it won't get flattened. So we could have used select for this task um, but then you'd have to manually flatten it afterwards in order to make a histogram. Um, okay, so I, I'll let them keep running the background. I think it takes like 20, 30 seconds or something. Um, and I'll go back up when, when they finish. If, if you're running on the, in fact, I think I have the, ah, there we go. Yeah, so it, it gives this flattened array if I use select instead, I get a jagged array. You can see there are sequence, or you know, one D arrays within this longer array. You get one array per uh, event, so you have to flatten this. And so, okay, I just take the flattened version that from select many, 
and make a histogram with JetPT. Okay. Uh, so, okay, so we can select and select many. You can filter out event properties, columns, basically branches um, that you aren't interested in. But another thing that we pretty much always want to do is filter out certain elements of sequences, like cer certain events or certain jets need to discard elements. So this is done with where. Uh, where applies a function that will output a Boolean value for each element. And it will, where will just discard any element if the function returned false. So like here, if you have one minus two, three, if you apply a filter for elements greater than zero, it'll filter out negative two. You'll just get the ones that pass this selection. And then another important operator is zip. So if we're not just dealing with scalar values per, per event, so like met is just one value per event. If you're dealing with something like jets, Jets have many properties. So there are many jets within the event, and then each jet has several different properties. So we need to wrap together the properties that correspond to the same physical object, like physics object. Um, so if we want to, if we make a cut on PT, then we're also filtering all of the other jet properties at the same time. Um, and so zip does this. It's it, it's it's very similar to like awkward.zip. That's that's there's a version of awkward that's that it's using in in the back end. So if you have um, a sequence like this that has two sequences within it, if you zip it, it'll it's basically a transpose of the matrix. Um, it'll match the first element of the first sequence to the first element of the first the second sequence, so one and two, and then the second elements three and four, and then the third elements five and six. And it's often done with the dictionary. So because it's easier to keep track of all of the, the properties. So if you have you know, property A in some branch and property B in some branch, and then you zip them, um, then you'll turn this into arrays that of uh, records, basically array of dictionaries. Um, and then so like the next task uh, requires doing this. So it says plot the PT of jets with eta less than, absolute value of eta less than one. So you need to make a cut on eta, but also propagate that cut to the, the PT values. So here I use a select many so that it will flatten. Um, and then I can make a dictionary or a record uh, for each jet of the PT and the ADA. Um, so these are both arrays, jet PT and is, is or sequence, um, and jet ADA is an array. Then I zip them together. And then I say where the absolute value of ADA is less than one. And no, you can use built-in functions, um, built-in Python functions like ABS. Um, and then I select the jet PT from those, those jets. And so then you know, I can execute that. Uh, and this will give the filtered jet PT values um, based on based on data. Uh, okay, and then that'll take a, a little bit to execute. Okay, so the next operator, um, another example of one is, is count. So if we need to filter based on a discrete number of objects, like a certain number of jets, then you need an operator like count that takes a sequence and just returns a scalar. Um, so it it's a re reduction uh, operation. So the count just gets the length of the sequence. So if there's an array with three elements, it'll output three. Um, so then the next one here says plot the missing ET of events that have at least two jets with PT greater than 40 GeV. And so I do aware to filter the events based on, uh, so inside the where condition for an event, I look at jet PT and then I look at the jet PTs where the PT is greater than 40 and then count the number of elements that pass this, the number of jets that pass this. And that's, if it's greater than or equal to two, then that event passes this filter and you select the met PT, uh, the met value. Okay. And it's, yeah, okay, that's still, it's still executing, um, but they will work. If you run on the, um, the uh, yeah, if you replace it with the, if you're running on binder, it should be much faster because it's just a thousand events. 
see. So I've, yeah, okay. So uh, maybe I'll bring up uh, the Slido if I have it somewhere. Just ah, yes, okay. Because I see I've got okay, like nine minutes left. So I'll start looking at questions. If, I'm not going to get through all of them. I haven't. This is still in progress because I haven't finished implementing all of them. The last three, I believe, are. Um, I have a sketch of what they'll look like, but uh, they'll have to wait for future versions of, of uh, the upper back end. So I'll look at the questions. Uh, ah, exactly. Yeah. So somebody said. Uh, if if that, you could uh, screen share the, the questions. Ah, yes. yes. So. Um, yeah, maybe I can. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. So yeah, somebody said that this look uh, and the previous presentation looks like our data frame. Yes, it is very much like uh, our data frame. Not to, it's somebody so that they're saying not totally Pythonic. I, I guess I, I don't know if I necessarily agree that it's not Pythonic. It is definitely very similar to our our data frame. Our data frame has a lot of the same motivations. the The main one of the main thrusts for Funky ADL is not having it tied to root. It's basically, you know, it's it's in Python and it's separated from, um, it doesn't, you know, this is using upper, it's not, Funky EDL itself, kind of the general language isn't tied to any backend. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I guess Pythonic is, you know, it's it's a subjective thing. It's, it's functional. This is, it's more of a functional programming thing. And Python is not the most functional language, but it certainly has, you can put in some of the aspects of functional programming. Um, what is the benefit of using funky deal compared to vanilla uproot slash awkward? So, yeah, I actually have a version of these, uh, of the benchmark tests where I implemented it in just uproot and awkward. That's on my GitHub, uh, profile somewhere. Um, it's like uproot benchmarks. So you certainly can do it. The benefit here, there's a few. So there are some kind of the, I think the main benefits come when you have to deal with more dimensions, like more axes. So when you start dealing with sequences of sequences of sequences and so on, this notation uh, based on queries is, I think it's easier to keep track of kind of which dimension you're in. With, with awkward, if you're uh, manipulating arrays with awkward, you have to kind of manually in your head keep track of which axis you're on, whereas funky ADL keeps track of it uh, for you based on where you are in, in the query. So that's one of the benefits. The other big one is that it, you don't have to use, funky ADL is not tied to uproot either, just like it's not tied to root. Um, you can make a back, back end that anything that can basically perform these operations, these, these query operators uh, can be used. So like there was a early version of an R data frame back end for funky ADL. Um, that, that still exists somewhere. And then we, and we already saw the XAOD and CMS um, backends. So you can use the same interface for many different types of data formats and also different backends. Um, uh, so that's, yeah, I, I would say those are two probably the biggest ones. It's also kind of ties you more to like the functional programming and declarative way. With upward and awkward, you can still it's still pretty easy to make it more you know, pr procedural and you can do loops with, um, you know, with upward and awkward, although it's not a good idea generally. Um, okay, so let's see, why did we use a Lambda function? Uh, so this is just part of the, it's just part of the language because these operators expect functions. So that that's, this is the functional programming part of it. The fact that these operators, the, the arguments to these operators are generally functions. Um, so, the it's you you need to pass it it's like like i was saying like map in in python is is an example of a built-in that expects a lambda i mean it, i guess it doesn't have to be a lambda function but if you, it's usually easier to read if it's a lambda function that's just right there in the line um so it's just a way of you know trying to stick to functional programming the the, the paradigm and making it more declarative because everything is contained within the query you're kind of like by restricting it more by requiring that the lambda function is in the query it it, uh, it it kind of limits how nasty it can get i mean it can still get very long 
but it's 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 not like you have to go look at some library you know three levels deep to see what function you're using um let's see usage of where for example is different from panda style is that for some special reason or would it be viable to try a more widely known api uh yeah so this is just i think a uh you know it's just a convention and the convention that, that's followed here is link so it's based on the link api of where uh, so I, I don't think that would change generally if there's an operator that already exists and there's not a in link and it doesn't have there's not an obvious reason to to diverge from that it's we usually use the the link syntax uh stylistically using camel case feels quite root versus uh snake casting operators which would be more python that's that's fair okay i mean that comes this comes from link it, this is that that the convention on capitalization is entire entirely from link so yeah i guess you could argue that's not entirely pythonic um is the aspirations to expand the supported queries to match link more closely joins and group by um I, okay, well, that's something you'd also have to, you know, have to ask, talk to Gordon, you know, other people who maintain other uh, backends. I think certainly, like, I've already started implementing more operators that are fairly directly from link, like order by, uh, joins and group by, maybe. I, I would say definitely that the idea is to expand to more link operators if they seem like they're useful um, for, for HEP. And, you know, data analysis tasks, and I'm starting to see which ones are more useful from like going through these benchmarks. Um, maybe in the last few minutes, yeah, I'll just go through because yeah, I still don't see any more questions. I'll just go through this this one here because one of the most important updates since VChat is well, the second thing here. Okay, so one thing that I implemented was choose, which is so just dealing with combinatorics is is always a pain, and it's a common thing with with HEP. Uh, so it, it's a thing that it's it's like n choose k like this kind of combination thing where you need to take like three jets uh you know like any combination of three jets you just don't want but you don't want to repeat them within each combination and you only want the unique combinations um so this operator helps with that because it's possible to do it without it but it's a huge pain it's so much easier to do this really common thing with with an operator like this i actually forgot to put the number here this should be choose two um because it it takes pairs. So this takes all unique pairs of elements. Um, and then the yeah, the important update that is in the, the release candidates for the next version of Funk ADL is that I've added um, the use of vector to, to deal with four, uh, four vectors. Um, so I have this function in the upper backend. In other backends, it doesn't necessarily make sense to have something like two foramenta because foramentum objects already exist, like t Lorentz vector already exists in, in root. But in uproot, um, in, in n tuples, usually like the, the components of, of, uh, of a four vector are in different branches. So two foramenta just creates the four vector object with using the vector library. And so this is something that I've uh, probably the most interesting update that I've done recently where something like this, where you need to plot the missing ET of, you know, some kind of pair of things here, opposite charge muon pairs with invariant mass. So you need to calculate the invariant mass. So here, um, let's see, I see I have like one minute left. Um, I pick out the muon charge and four vector, I call P4 here, and then I choose pairs of them. And then I look at, you know, where the charge is, where they have opposite sign charge. And then I, the nice thing is with vector, I can just add these two four vectors together and say dot mass. And then I can say mass is between 60 GeV and 120 GeV. And then if there's at least one of those, then I pick out the uh, the met. And uh, that's, that's what the task is. So then uh, this now works. So it eventually we'll catch up. I see some of the other cells have, uh, have, have executed, but this, this works now. And then I say at the end here, just there, there are some unfinished tasks. I've got some things sketched in, but they don't work yet. But hopefully in the next version of, of the upper backend. <laughs>